Thank you so much for coming today. I'm Sarah Wilson, a senior editor on the Amazon Books team, and I'm a huge fan of today's guest. Her first book was a little book called The Night Circus, became a huge international bestseller, and we've been waiting eight long years for her next novel. <laughs> um, she's here today to talk about it. It's called The Starless Sea. It's every bit as magical as her first. Please join me in welcoming Erin Mortenstern to the stage. Thank you. So nice to see you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. I'm kind of disappointed that this isn't like a giant actual fishbowl. Yeah. <laughs> like with like a little plastic castle. That could be fun. We could yeah. arrange that maybe. Next cool. Next time. You have to write another book. Okay, first. maybe I'll write like some fish themed thing. And there we you can, go. I like that. It can be appropriate. Absolutely. So you write your first book, it gets published. Yeah. And then it's just like blows up. And then everything everyone ever told me doesn't happen to debut authors happened to me. Yes. So I was kind of ill prepared. Yeah, how, how, what, what was that like? Just totally it surreal. It was weird. It's still weird. Um, I think I was so focused on just trying to write the story the way I wanted to tell the story. And I kind of didn't have much past that in my head. So. I thought it was gonna be a weird book that maybe a few weird people would like, and I underestimated the number of weird people <laughs> who a lot very us. much responded to The Night Circus in ways that I could, I, I don't think I possibly could have imagined it. Yeah. Just the, the like, enthusiasm mm -hmm. of the response to that book. And it's just lasted. I mean, it has. That book has just stayed on everyone's mind, and it's still a book, still a book I recommend all the time as oh, if someone says, you. what should I read? I'm like, oh, you gotta read The Night Circus. We like book pushers. Yes. <laughs> like when you're like, you have to That's read this. Book pushers. So obviously, just a small amount of pressure to oh, yeah. write a second book. Then. Yeah. Just when did that really that started kick in immediately? For you? Okay. Yeah. Because people like as soon as the Night Circus is out, is like, when's your next book coming out? It's like this took me like five years to write. <laughs> like I, like they're like, why isn't it out yet? Like two months after this one came out. It, so it was hard because no one was waiting for the Night Circus and people were waiting for this one. Absolutely. And I really wanted to get it right. And I wanted it to be, I wanted it to feel as special as the Night Circus did. I didn't want to just like write something as quickly as I could just to have another book out, even like, d like despite the constant things on Twitter of like, when's your next book coming out? When's your next book coming out? That slowly morphed into, I think Aaron Morgenstern might be a one hit wonder. Ugh. Like, it's like, I'm going to turn off my internet right now. Yeah, you actually did that, I actually, I, I kind of unwillingly turned off my internet. Mm -hmm. I moved to the Berkshires in Western Massachusetts in 2016, and I did not have cable or internet for two years, uh, which is a <laughs> weird time to not have cable or internet, but it's probably why the book is done. Um, because it allowed me to just kind of shut off everything literally and focus on telling the story I wanted to tell. Is that kind of what you ended up needing to get? I think to find I did. I, I think I needed to. I needed to kind of create a um, artificial bubble because I got to write the Night Circus in a bubble, and there there weren't people waiting for it. There weren't people asking about it, and I got to. It just was me in the story, and so like having no cable and no internet helped me artificially create that to write Starless Sea in. What were sort of the first seeds of the different stories? I think um, I've had this space, I have spaces in my head that just appear there and I'm not really sure what they're doing, like all this imaginary architecture that's just in my head. And I've had this sort of underground library-esque space in my head for years and years. There's like, I think, some of the oldest things in this book are probably like things I wrote maybe like 15 years ago. Oh, really? Like they're very, very old pieces, like little tiny fragments of things. I had a, a notebook um, that just said there's a pirate in the basement and I didn't know what he was doing in the basement. I didn't know where this basement was. I didn't know what I was gonna use that for. I just had it in a, in a notebook in like, I keep files of like um, pieces without places. Oh, nice. And just kind of to keep ideas down because I will forget. I will forget that there's a pirate in the basement if I don't <laughs> write it down. So um, I started pulling together different little bits and pieces from other things I had at the same time that I was exploring this library space and trying to figure out what the story was behind it. Um, and it kind of started coming together more when I started focusing on Zachary, who's 
the protagonist and using him as the through line to tell the story of the space. So do you, as you were going along, did you kind of get to various points where you thought, oh, I, I need something, let me go to the notebook? Kind of, kind of. I, I kind of write around things. I'll write bits of backstory or side story or try to approach the space from a completely different angle or like I'll write something that I think maybe was like like very deep backstory or write something that doesn't feel related at all. At one point, um, um, I was sending messy drafts to my editor and at one point she said to maybe tone down the fairy tale and I said, no. Um, so I wrote actual fairy tales <laughs> <laughs> that are now in the book as their own isolated things as another. There's several different books within the book, but one of them is a book of fairy tales. I love that. I, I was wondering about those fairy tales, if any of them are parts or whole from things that you'd already, that you'd heard or if there, some of them are a little bit like there's flavor from other mm -hmm. things, but one of the things with there's, um, there are fairy tales and then there's sort of an underlying mythology and I was very conscious of not having it be directly lifted from anything. There's nothing that's a, a retelling. There's all things that are sort of playing with flavors from different things. There's like, there's a Greek mythology undertone. There's a little bit of Egyptian mythology. And then with the fairy tales, I just started thinking of like things that felt like fairy tales. I had like lists of fairy tale keywords. I had like, witch and keys and like, like someone's wearing a cloak and had these flavors that I wanted to draw from. And then I also, when at the point that I was doing the fairy tales, I had all my symbols already. Okay. So I, I went in and said, well, one fairy tale should have keys and one fairy tale should have swords and, and that sort of thing. So that was helpful in, in, in shaping those. Did you ever reach a point over that eight year period in between books where you just thought, no, can't do this right now. Have to set it aside. Many, many, many times. Yeah, I actually, um, for a while, I was working on a different project that just wasn't coming together. In that, like, interim, like right after the Night Circus came out, I had the sort of manuscript in progress that I thought was going to be my next book, and it just would not cooperate. I, it, it felt stuck with it. I didn't know what I wanted to say with it, and then I put it aside, and I didn't know what I wanted to do, and I was in that point where, it was probably around when the Twitter started wondering if I was a one-hit wonder, and maybe I started wondering too. And I thought, if I'm gonna write another book, why am I writing it? Mm -hmm. And why does anyone write a book? And why do we tell stories? And that's when I went back to this space and this project and thought, oh, I should write a book about books. And in the course of writing it, it became more a book about stories. But I think it was, I needed to do that sort of uh, like reflective analysis of why I was doing what I was doing. Was that really hard to keep that out of your head? I like the little, the Twitter comments or that old yeah, sophomore slump. It is, know. I mean, the, the sophomore novel is like, yeah. this is, it's such a big deal on a couple of different levels. And the, the thing that I kept thinking about was, this is my opportunity to establish what an Aaron Morgenstern novel is. Because the Night Circus is its own thing, but then the Night Circus combined with the Starless Sea, like you kind of get an idea of like what my whole jam is. Um, so like I, I thought about that, and I thought about the ways that it's similar to the Night Circus, and the ways that I want it to be different. It's that magic. It's yeah, I was gonna say I think so it, there, I don't think I'm gonna write in anything that's like very gritty, realistic, <laughs> like <laughs> crime thrillery things. Probably, probably not gonna to. do it. I'll do like magical crime thriller at some point, maybe. Yeah, there you go. That would be pretty good. You, uh, in the acknowledgments, you thank Lev Grossman for. It's because I stole his bees and his keys, and he gave me permission. I asked him at when The Magician's Land came out. I was already toying with everything, and I, I had like bee and key were kind of high on my list of symbols that I was pretty sure I was gonna use. Um, and so I asked him if I could steal them, and he said yes, so. I, I did have permission. So you'd had that kind of in your head for a while. Yes. I was thinking about those. I, I've been I've been drawing bees and keys and swords and things on, on things for years. Okay. Do you have a little collection going? I do. I started like collecting things with bees on them, and now like I'll see more things that I'm just like, oh, it has a bee on it. So it's like I don't need everything that has <laughs> a bee on it. I, I probably need to calm it down. The stories, I, I just it's so incredible, and I think one of the most incredible 
elements of it is how it just weaves these different stories together in unexpected places. And as you go along, you're like, oh, this person is, you know, just how well woven it is. Is that, did you kind of know as you went along who was going to be who? No. No? Like, not at all. It, I was going to say, it looks like I knew what I was doing, yes. doesn't it? Like, for a long time. I, I, think <laughs> it, I think it came from working and reworking and rewriting. I rewrote the book a lot. Um, I probably rewrote the back half from scratch at least three times. Oh, wow. Um, and I changed things, and I tweaked things, and I took things out, and I layered things back in. And I think because I did all of that work, like, removing things and and changing things and adjusting things, I kind of finessed everything so much that like I could go in and say, oh, well, I could connect this part that's new to this part that was old and it looks like I planned it. Um, but it was really just, I looked at what I had and, and tried to like really tie everything together as much as I could. But first I had to have all those things there. So there was a lot of um, just writing and writing and writing and exploring and adding material so then I could find those connections and layer those story elements in to something that I'm really glad it, it looks like a coherent whole oh, it does. At, at the end of it because it was word soup for a very long time. <laughs> you also include at like the very end of the book all of a sudden a character comes in that you met in the beginning but didn't seem a cat mm -hmm. so but then towards the end she really starts playing a more significant role did, was she someone that you kind of felt like wasn't done? Um, I always wanted to have Kat in the book more, and Kat was a character who you meet very early on, and then for a while I didn't know what to do with her. Mm -hmm. And then she became a, a perfect way to have the story come full circle, because I always wanted it to come full circle. And she was a great opportunity to do another book within the book, because I, I had that idea that I wanted... Um, multiple books within the book, and I wanted one to be a diary, but I didn't know whose. Uh -huh. um, so that one of the books within the book is Cat's Diary, and it's 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 very different in style from a lot of the rest of the book. But I probably had some of the most fun writing those bits. They're kind of they're some of my favorite parts of the book. Okay, just is it the diary style, the I, format? I think or what they were so? just easier to write. Okay, because I had her voice in my head, mm -hmm. and I could just let her talk and write things down. And she had a very particular voice right away. I had more than what's in the finished book. I have extra oh. diary entries and all sorts of other things. I, I probably cut down by like half, I'd say, of what I have, because I, I tend to overwrite everything, and then I, then I pare down okay. and pick the best bits. Okay. Do you tend to be able to do, clear the way yourself, or do you use your editor also? I'm pretty good mm -hmm. at self-editing. I. Um, I'm not overly precious with like my writing. Like I'll write a page, and I am totally fine with. I spent all day on these like five pages, and I'm not going to use any of them. Like I, I know that's just part of my process. I, I tend to have to write things wrong before I figure out how to write them right, and it can be really frustrating because I'll go days or sometimes weeks or like I've. I had probably a stretch where there were months where I was working and I was writing a lot and I didn't end up using any of what I wrote in that time period. But I don't think you can tell that when you're working on it. You kind of have to trust that even if you're not going to use the words that you're writing on any particular day, they're getting you to the words you're going to write tomorrow or next week. And it's like a means to an end, even if it's it's kind of a frustrating journey. <laughs> That's great that you're able to kind of move past that. Yeah, you have to kind go. of be zen about it. Yeah. You kind of have to let it go. And it's like, I, I think there was part of me that wanted my writing process to be less messy the second time around. But I think it's just my style. I think I have to, I have to play in a space and I have to write my way around it in as many different ways as possible before I figure out what the right way to tell the story is. I really enjoyed all the references to some of the children's books, like the Alice in Wonderland. And were those some of your favorites? Yeah, I basically any book that's name checked in this book is yeah. something that I love. Yeah. Um, and I, I tried to pull in those really classic it, children's adventure sort mm -hmm. of books, and I like um, the the idea of the Alice in Wonderland stuff. I didn't um, because Alice. Alice's Adventures in Wonderland was originally titled Alice's Adventures Underground. Um, and so I liked that subterranean aspect and the rabbit hole mm -hmm. 
aspect. And I like, there's something that feels nicely like mysterious and kind of possible. Like there's so many like weird cave systems and things being discovered that like you didn't know was right there. And there's something kind of weirdly intimate about there could be these giant spaces under your feet and you don't even know. Um, I like that kind of magic that feels tangible and I liked that rabbit hole idea. And with Alice in Wonderland in particular, I got thinking um, if you were that kid and you didn't open that door or if, like you didn't follow that rabbit, like how does that change your trajectory? Because I like taking a children's book sensibility and writing it for adults. I could, I, well, I write it for myself mostly. I'm kind of my ideal audience. Like I write the book I want now and I'm 41. So I, I want to have those like things that feel like those books you read as a child mm -hmm. um, and feel like they have that wonder and magic and possibility to them. Cause I don't, I don't think it's fair to just let kids have that sort of adventure. No, no yeah. I agree. Were there any that you wanted to get in there, like little details of other books that you just weren't? Oh, I think it? most of the things I wanted, I knew I wanted to have, like, I hit the big pillars on there. I wanted to have Alice in Wonderland references. I wanted to have Harry Potter references. I wanted to have Narnia references, though I did put my own kind of, like, I'm not super fond of Narnia, and I kind of let one of the characters articulate my thoughts on Narnia. <laughs> um, but um, there's some, there is something lovely about, the, I've always liked the door at the back of the wardrobe. Like there's something about that double layered door. Like not only can you open it, then you can open it again. And I, um, there's, um, there's a bit that mentions that Zachary would read that sort of book in his closet, and that's something that I would do when I was little. I had this big closet, and it kind of had the door, and then a little like, like it went deeper. So there was like a nook, and I would pull in pillows and blankets and sit there with my book, and I liked being alone with the story, like wrapped away and cozy. Were you also a library kid? Did you go I was, well my mom is a librarian oh. um, and yeah. I was always a library kid and I think um, now it's probably why I'm a little compulsive about owning my own books. Compulsive like, in what way? I, I'm kind of, I might have to admit that I'm a hoarder at some point because <laughs> it's, no, but it's only, for, <laughs> it's only for very specific things. It's only for like books in particular because I, I want to own it and I want it to be mine and I like them as objects. I'm a paper book person and I could probably, and I'm also a slow reader, so it's not the best combination to have all of these books and I'm such a slow reader and I could probably go years without buying a new book and still not read everything that's in my house. And then of course I bought a house so there's so much more room for books than there used to be. Like I used to have to be like, well I'm out of shelf space and my apartment's not that big and now I'm just like, well, there's always the basement. <laughs> Do you ever purge? Like, I'm never going to read I this. Only, I purge things that I've read and didn't love enough to keep. And then I'll occasionally purge, like, doubles. Because the other thing I'll do, which is terrible, is I'll forget that I have a book and I'll buy multiple copies of it. Or, like, my husband and I will, like, separately buy the same books because it's something we both wanted to read and we don't communicate properly before we go book shopping. <laughs> Do you have a do you have a full library in your house? We have well, every room sort of becomes a the version library. of the library. We do have an actual library, though. We um, when we got the house, I was looking for something that would have a separate office space, and we lucked into finding this building that has like an addition that's octagonal, and the f the first floor is floor to ceiling bookshelves with the staircase that goes around the oh. the side that goes up to what is my office. Um, and when we were looking at the house once, there was like an open house and there were a bunch of realtors. And this guy was standing looking at all these like beautiful, beautiful bookshelves and said out loud, this seems like wasted space. And I thought, get out of my house. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's like the perfect, and we got like the big comfy chairs for it. And we actually, we're probably gonna need to build more shelves <laughs> into that space. Is your, is your husband also a big reader? Yes, he's a bigger reader than I am. And then we, he has, like, I'm very good at, like, picking out, oh, this is a, this is an Adam book. It's, like, and he reads a lot of nonfiction and a lot of sci-fi. And um, then he has his office, which I don't think he could fit more books in it, but he somehow keeps putting them in. I was just, like, we have other rooms that you could put the books in, but he likes to have, like, the, they're, like, 
in, in categories and then like he has like the nonfiction shelf and he has this wonderful shelf of like vintage sci-fi paperbacks oh, like cool. the old school ones and then I just started uh, um, because he has those when we were in a used bookstore I found um, some of the same sort of style that was um, very old school um, paperback um, detective novels. I found a bunch of oh. Dashiell Hammett, so I was just like, maybe I'll start my shelf for my office and mine can be be detective things. That would be really cool. Do you have like your big fire, I'm grabbing these, ty these books are going with me? Ooh. I guess you're grabbing a oh. lot of books. No, now, now, <laughs> now I'm worried. Now, I had never thought of this before. You have it? Um, oh, I'd probably be too busy grabbing my cat um, <laughs> if the house was actually on fire. I think I might have to just like like priorities and, and the books would have to go. Um, I don't think there's anything that like, there's nothing that's irreplaceable. Um, I am, I'm trying to start collecting like older books and, and vintage copies. And um, I, I love um, just books as objects. So even like things that I've read before, I like um, if there's a fancy edition of it, I want to pick it up. And, mm -hmm. Uh, that sort of thing, because I think there's some very, very pretty books, and people keep doing these like illustrated editions of things now. Yes. And I'm just like, oh, I already have that, but this one has pictures. So, mm -hmm. I like the other, like the UK edition or the, yes. all of the international editions. Are pretty. Those are fun. And uh, Instagram is problematic for that, because now I can find like, oh, ooh, yeah. this cover is pretty. And my husband is Canadian, so sometimes when we go to Canada, I'll be like, ooh, the Canadian cover is better. <laughs> oh, that's that's the doubles. You yes, with multiple copies. Have you ever thought about writing young adult or middle grade? I think, oh, well, people seem to think I write young adult. So um, I like where I am because I think um, I'm not wild about age categorization mm -hmm. for storytelling, especially the sort of stories that I tell. And I think that um, the this, this spot where I'm at, the American Library Association has a, something called the Alex Award that they give. Mm -hmm. Um, to books that are written for an adult audience with appeal for teen readers, and I think that's that's kind of perfect for me. And actually, I first heard about it. I was reading um, John Connolly's *The Book of Lost Things*, and it mentioned that that's like that had won the Alex Award, and I, I saw that phrase as like, oh, that's what I want to write. Because I had thought when I was first starting, like maybe I'd write YA or maybe I'd want to do children's books, but that was kind of that little, like, a light, the light bulb went off in my head. And it's just like, oh, you can do that. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, the Night Circus won the Alex Award. So it was kind of that perfect full circle there moment. But I think I think um, my books can certainly be read by teenagers. People sometimes get, like, upset when I say they're not YA, thinking that it means, like, teenagers shouldn't read them. But that, that's not what I mean. Oh. Like, I mean, they're not categorized by publishing as being written for a teen audience. And I think I like that general audiences sort of thing where it can be a book for a wider age range. And you read a pretty wide range. I do. I read a lot of different things. I read um, I read a lot of fantasy. I read a lot of um, contemporary stuff. I read, um, uh, like I just started um, uh, Robin Hobbs' Assassin's Apprentice. I've never oh, read. Yes. I've never read that series. Oh, okay. and, I was, and I saw I like Speaking that. of Beautiful Illustrated Editions. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of wanted to do that, like get lost in like a like a big chewy epic fantasy kind of thing when I'm doing all this traveling for a book tour, so I can like forget that I'm on airplanes and like That's sink into the book. That's perfect. One to do that with also because there's more than one, so you can just I know, like, keep and going. And I have the mass market paperback, so they like fit oh, in yeah. my carry on really nicely. Perfect. So I have like the one with me, and then I have the second one is already like tucked in the bottom of the bag. You did a celebrity picks for us for our Amazon book review blog, and one of the books you chose was Underland. And yes, you, you I still haven't finished Underland oh, okay. yet. I'm actually really mad at Underland because Underland is the book I wanted when I was writing The Starless Sea. Like I wanted like a like an interesting nonfic about those sort of underground places and that like history and myth and and that sort of thing. So I'm glad I get to read it now. But I am a little bit annoyed. Do you like to visit? Have you been to the Seattle's underground? No. Thing? Oh, no? That, see, this is the problem with like book tour yeah. things. It's like I've been to all these cities, but I've seen bookstores and very little else. Surface. No and I think sometimes I need to do like the like I'll do like book tour redux, and I'll go to all the places that I've been and actually do things mm -hmm. in like I've never gotten to do like the Seattle things, even though this is the second time I've been here. Right. 
You said that, um, I think it was about that book, actually, that you really like places that are real that seem magical. Mm -hmm. what, what would be an example of one of those for you? Oh, um, well, I like, I like big fancy nature mm -hmm. things. Like I like, um, there's something that is, I think like going, thinking about Underland, like anytime I've been in like an actual like cave system, like they're fascinating. Like just the, the rock formations and like the way you can see what time has done to a space, like the, the, the way like the mineral deposits will be from whatever like water has been trickling down. And I went um, on a cave trip in um, Virginia and at one of the, those like tourist caves and they're like, it's kind of weird because it's like you Disneyfied a cave a little bit. Oh, really? Yeah, like there's like the gift shop and then oh, like the in like, the and then here you go into the cave. It's like, but then once you're in it, like, mm -hmm. it feels very special. And at one point um, on one of the tours, they did the, like, okay, stand still. And then they shut off all the artificial lighting so you can experience full cave darkness. And you think beforehand, like, oh, it's going to be really dark. And then it's darker than that. Oh, really? Like, it's oh. just, like, the darkest dark you could possibly imagine. And then, of course, afterwards, I was just like, how do I write that without just saying it's really, really dark? Yeah. I use the word darkness a lot in this book. At one point, I was just like, <laughs> maybe I need to, like kind of find other ways to say that it's very dimly lit or it's very dark. But it, like, so it's, you it's underground, it was problematic. Mm -hmm. Was that one of the experiences you used when you were trying to think about what it looks like in your head? Yeah, and, and I didn't, all that? I never wanna overdo it when I'm describing things. I think as soon as I tell you that it's underground, that gives you an idea. It's like how with the Night Circus, as soon as I say it's black and white and it's Victorian, like you have like images to draw from just with that much description, so. Um, but I did try to think of how to make it feel like it recalled the, the undergroundness. And a lot of it was about trying to conjure the idea of like there's a weight above it, like that there's other things going on in, in the spaces above uh, to kind of feel like you had that little bit of pressure over you. But I didn't want anyone to feel too claustrophobic. Right, you're, too. I was going to ask if yes. you were claustrophobic. No, I'm... I'm I'm not claustrophobic. You could probably like lock me in like a box or a closet, but I I do that claustrophobia reaction in crowds. Oh. Like it's like if there's too many people, like that's mm -hmm. when I and I and you can't really move. Like leaving a really crowded concert is like my nightmare. Like when you get like caught up in the like you can't really move and you kind of hope that the flow of people is going where you want it to go. And I kind of have to like stop and do like breathing exercises. Uh -huh. But I um. The whole idea of like the door to sort of a second chance to do something again um, or relive a moment that you let slip by was that something? Have you had that experience in your life, um, or anything I you would like to again? Oh, I'll have to think about that one. I, I th there was something that I really liked when I gave. As I, for anyone who doesn't know, there's. Um, Zachary had had a chance to open a magic door when he was a kid and didn't do it, and there was something that I really like found fascinating about that, which, I, and I wanted to explore, like, what does that do to you? Like, if you didn't follow the rabbit down the rabbit hole, like, do you think about the rabbit? And um, originally, in very, very early drafts, um, I had had Zachary open the door, and he had oh, been to this time. place, and he kind of written it off as a dream. Um, and then he revisited it, but the more I worked on it, the more I thought, like, it would be more interesting if it was a possibility or a chance that he didn't take. And like and that's sort of where this like it started coming together more when I and when I kind of took that away from him. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, I can't think of anything specific, but there's something that I like about that idea. There's a whole underlying theme of um fate gives you doors but you have to choose to open them. Yes. In that like fate versus free will, which is something that I like to kind of question a lot in this one. And also time, you know, that yes. things just don't have to be a certain way, that it can have a happy ending, even though it doesn't go the way you think it will. It's true. I like there's, there were a lot of things about like um, kind of traditional story structure like that I wanted to dismantle mm -hmm. a little bit about like when things happen or when you go on your adventure and like maybe like your adventure is, like, catches up with you years after you could have taken it and therefore it, because it's happening at a different time, it's a different sort of adventure. Would you, there's a, a part in the book too where um, Kat is asked if she believes fairy tales are real. And um, you know, she's, I won't give you the answer to that one, but uh, 
if you had to choose a fairy tale to be real, what would you choose? Oh, see, but so many fairy tales are scary. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking of like all those like old school like grim fairy tales where like people get their toes cut off and. Um, and they didn't seem that grim when. No, I don't know, just like of course like your toes got cut off. Like, sure. um, of course you got eaten by that wolf. Like. Um, the first one that came to mind is actually a weird choice, but it is my favorite, and there's a lot of like subtle references to it in this, which is the Snow Queen. Oh, yes. Um, and I'm not sure, wh I don't know if I want it to be real. I just think I like some of the, the space and the atmosphere and the tone mm -hmm. of it. Um, now I'm thinking. Now, now I'm starting to like think in, in terms of like, well, would I want a gingerbread house, like an actual house, <laughs> like if you were gonna like take fairy tale things and make them real? Or um, is the Snow Queen the one that you always wanted to read? The if Snow Queen is my option. is pro if I had to pick a, like a favorite fairy tale, like mm -hmm. the Snow Queen and Little Red Riding Hood are kind of like those oh. like up there. Little Red Riding Hood. And I like the stuff that like people. I, I like retellings. Like I um, like. Angela Carter's The Bloody Chamber is one of my favorite things. I actually, at one point, had a reference to, I think in Kat's class, where they're talking about like story and fairy tale retellings. At one point, I had a, a, a line in there about how, like, but no fairy tale retellings are ever as good as Angela Carter. Like, because like, The Bloody Chamber is kind of the end all be all for retellings, like, which is, says something about like how I do really kind of like the darker side <laughs> of that sort of story. Mm -hmm. But I, I could reread that book a million times. Are there any other books that you kind of would like to reread or do reread? I do. I reread sometimes. Again, I'm a slow reader, so mm -hmm. I always have the to read pile, and then there's things that I want to get back to. Um, I want to reread The Secret History oh. because it's one of my all time favorites, and I love it, and I haven't read it. And I read it long enough ago that my life was very different when I read it. Mm -hmm. So I kind of want to revisit it now and, and see what the reading experience is like. Did you read The Goldfinch? I did. I also gave someone in this book my opinion on The Goldfinch. Oh, yeah. yeah. Which is that I love the secret history. Yes, I do remember yeah. that now that you say that. That's funny. You're channeling a lot into uh, I know, it's a lot. Well, I mean, I, it's a book unusual. about stories and books, and, and so I got to kind of just put uh, books I like and video games I like and sort of tone that I wanted, because I, I really did... I think because I, I wanted to go back and, and think about why I was writing in the first place, I had to have fun with it, and I had to put a whole bunch of things I liked in it, and, and like then add cats and bees and and all sorts of things that like like there's a whole lot of wish fulfillment in here. The the biggest one is probably there's something called the kitchen, yes. um, which is like a dumb waiter on the in the rooms, uh, and you just tell it what you want, and it can give you absolutely anything. And it's basically just the replicator from Star Trek. Because I've always wanted that. Like, it's just like anything you want, just instantly, and it's all the perfect temperature. I was it's, thinking it's, Jetsons. It's, 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 ah, that, that's the dream. That is the dream. I like yeah. how that turns out, too. Okay. The kitchen. Sweet. No spoilers. No, 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 no spoilers at all. Sure. Um, I think we have one more question, and then I'll, we can open it up to audience questions. Cool. So if folks want to head to a microphone, if you have a question, um, then we'll, we'll get right back to you. Um, so, Starless Sea, it's out. It's wonderful. Thank you. Are you feeling a little less pressure for your next book? Are you kind of able to relax? Um, I think there's always going to be pressure. Um, I, I, no one started in on the maybe she's a two-hit wonder yet. but um, You've passed that. I, that is over. I, 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 think, um, I think I feel like I might have the hang of this. But I also know I, I'm gonna have to do the same process again. I'm gonna have to have the messy, slow process where I kind of explore a space and figure out what the story is behind it. But the one thing I do know is uh, The Circus is a very autumnal book and Starlessy is very much a winter creature. So clearly I have to write a spring book next. Yes. Oh, you do, absolutely. Yes, and then I'll write a summer book and then I won't know what to do with myself after <laughs> that. Then you start over. Exactly. Do it all again. Well, I won't, I won't bug you about when you're going to write that, but I mean, well, it's, we it is, it's not going to be book shaped for a very long time. It's, it's right now I have like a folder of notes uh -huh. that, and it's not, it's not anywhere near a book. Like I, it's, it's hopefully going to be book shaped sooner rather than later. Hopefully it won't take quite as long. Um, but I definitely need to clear the decks and, and close myself off with it again. 
Do you think you'll just start ignoring social media at all? Oh, yeah. I, like, I I've I've done. I'm trying to keep my calendar from, like, February to May for next year as clear as possible since it's spring. Um, and then just lock myself away with it and ignore everything else and see what sort of messy draft I have at the end of that time period and probably throw most of it.